Well, I'm here with Jonathan Mildenhall. He was named one of Forbes' most influential CMOs in 2017. And now today he is speaking at the executive management briefings and the Tulsa Business Forums, which are both put on by the Spears School of Business. Jonathan, we are so glad to have you here and lucky to get you to come to Oklahoma. You worked with Coca-Cola before you decided to come over to Airbnb. And so what made you take a risk in, on this decision, really? Mm. It's a really interesting question because um, I've been at Coca-Cola for nearly eight years and the creative and financial fortunes of the Coca-Cola company during that time uh, were really quite transformative. Uh, and creativity was just one of the drivers of the um, uh, uh, turnaround in the financial performance of the company, but it was a significant driver. Um, and, you know, I really didn't I really didn't think that I had another chapter of my career. I was you know, senior vice president at the Coca-Cola company, great life in Atlanta. Anyway, I get a call from Airbnb and, um, asking me if I'd have dinner with Brian Chesky, who's the chief exec um, of Airbnb. I flew to San Francisco and I met him. And at the time, he was just a 32-year-old guy. And he had this vision for a platform, for a brand, for a world that was bigger than anything that I'd been exposed to. And I knew then that my job for a period of time was to serve his vision and get the entire world to embrace Airbnb as um, the most influential travel brand of our time. And, and I think that we, we, we did that. Uh, but really, it was just a question of wanting to serve this incredible entrepreneur and have the world understand what his vision meant. Right. And it, I, one of my favorite things I've heard you say is that when you told your mom you were doing this, she just thought you were up and moving to San Francisco to open a bed and breakfast. <laughs> right. So how did you change people's view of Airbnb through all of this strategic planning? Mm. Well, it was, um, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's really only about now that my mom is like, okay, she doesn't, you know, kind of begrudge the fact that I left the Coca-Cola company because all her friends know what the Coca-Cola company was and they didn't know what Airbnb was at the time. Um, uh, but the first thing that we had to do, and I would encourage everybody to think about this, in 2014, Airbnb was still a niche player in the travel industry. And most of the media coverage on Airbnb was asking this question, why would anybody want strangers to stay in their home? And why would anybody want to go and stay in a stranger's home? So strangers was the biggest kind of impediment to Airbnb's growth. And so the first campaign that we ever did was this um, single woman traveling around the world, staying in different Airbnbs, and the voiceover went, Dear stranger, when I first booked this trip, my friends thought I was crazy. Why would I want to stay in somebody else's house? Right. And that was our first presentation of Airbnb to the world where we were actually saying, this is this platform where you can stay in people's houses, but everybody you stay with is a stranger. And as soon as we put that out into public conversation, um, the, the, the conversation just ignited around Airbnb. I mean, the traffic that we drove to the site uh, was so voluminous that we nearly crashed the site and the financial planning people wouldn't report on the impact because they just wanted to check that we hadn't been attacked by bots. Um, uh, but what was brilliant is then the media narrative changed. It was like, okay, this is no longer the unspoken tension of Airbnb. Airbnb is one of these brands that's really committed to try and bring the world together and trying to create a sense of community trust um, uh, through the platform uh, where there is no such thing as a stranger, it's just a friend that you have not yet met. I mean, you have the brand on right now. You are a walking, talking, marketing guru. So tell me kind of how you all came up with this Airbnb logo and what led to that. Mm. Well, the original logo for Airbnb, and anybody watching this, it would be a good idea to go and search what the original logo was um, because it was basically a bubble typeface. Um, and yet the founders, the three founders of Airbnb, wanted Airbnb to become a global iconic brand. And uh, the original typeface just couldn't be read by people in China, people in um, uh, Korea and Japan. And so we needed to come up with something that was telegraphic, more iconic, and uh, really, really distinctive. And we came up with this, which we called the uh, Balo. Uh, and we introduced it in 2014, and now all around the world, the brand recognition for this logo is up there with some of the world's most recognizable logos. 
Throughout the process, I mean, money is always an issue when you're trying to market things. How did you get so many celebrities? Beyonce, Justin Bieber, these people were posting about Airbnb. Why were they on board? Yeah, I feel very grateful um, because I didn't, truly, I didn't believe it. Um, when a friend of mine in LA, a guy called Jeff Beecher, uh, he called me up and he said, and it started it with this way, he said, Mariah Carey is just finishing her residency in, at, in Las Vegas. If you give her a great house on the beaches of Malibu, um, just so that she can kind of uh, decompress and spend time with her family, um, I can get her to talk about that on social media. And I said, well, thanks very much, but you know, I know how much it is to work with somebody like Mariah. And my budget at the time was, yeah, it, it was tiny, $25 million on a global basis for PR, brand marketing, performance marketing, policy marketing. Uh, and he said, all we have to do is give her just a really, really good experience. So it's actually gonna be authentic endorsement. If she likes the house and she's had a good time with the kids and she'll just kind of like say, thanks Airbnb for the house and my great time with the kids. And um, uh, so we did it and it was a tiny risk because if she didn't have a good, there, there was no contract. It was just like, take the house Mariah if you like it. And she did. And when Mariah tweeted that she was staying on Airbnb, the whole media conversation just blew up because the conversation was, if it's good enough for Mariah, it's good enough for anybody. Mm -hmm. And at the time, really the profile, the traveler profile was millennial students traveling around the world on a budget. Um, but all of the um, press was, if it's good enough for Mariah, then it's good enough for you, it's good enough for me, it's good enough for all of us. Mariah opened the floodgates and then we just got a constant stream of celebrities saying, I'm going on a tour, can I stay uh, on the platform? And I've never ever paid a single dollar to a celebrity, uh, and yet we've had 65 of the most influential men and women in the music industry, in the film industry, uh, uh, staying in Airbnb here in the States and all over the world. Wow. And you talk a lot about purpose branding. That's what your whole speech is about here today. Where do you find your personal purpose in all mm. of this? It's, it's a great question because I don't think that we as individuals spend enough time really thinking about some of the values that we should hold dear, should be conscious of each and every day so that we can lean towards them and protect anything from compromising them. Uh, and uh, so for me, I spent a long time really thinking about the story that I want to be told about me when I'm not in the room, when I'm no longer here. And if I can just have everybody say, Jonathan was a good human being and he inspired a sense of creativity, um, then I will be very proud of that. And actually, if you look at my work, if you look at the body of work at Coca-Cola, look at the body of work at um, Airbnb, and now with some of my new clients, you see that humanity, all of my work just drips with humanity. I like my, the films that I do to be you know, intimate portraits of people's faces. I like the feeling to be conversational. I like there to be a sense of tactile humanity in my work. And I'm hoping that everything that I do is also surprisingly creative. And now that you've reached this point of success and you've gone through things in your life to get there, you talked about keeping that child, that eight-year-old in you. For How important is that to keep mm. the creative part? Uh, the best um, feeling is when you're just in spirit uh, and um, your heart and your stomach, um, uh, those kind of feelings never really change. It's that how you felt, how I felt as an eight-year-old. And when I let my eight-year-old dominate a particular meeting or a particular period of time, I know that I'm curious and I'm optimistic and I'm confident because I don't, and there are other times when I need to be the 52-year-old guy that is my right. head <laughs> and that needs to lead the conversation. But I'm really, really conscious, literally, and I tell people, Forgive me, but the eight-year-old's coming out right now. And, and I'd encourage everybody to feel really, really confident about sometimes tapping into that little girl or tapping into that little boy that um, uh, where the world was just hugely optimistic and a huge creative canvas that you could fill. And you just welcomed some little ones of your own. Tell me about that work-life balance and what it means to have, have your family around. Well, uh, work-life balance, I don't, I don't know if that's ever going to come. My kids, my daughter is only 20 uh, weeks old. My son is 16 weeks old. 
Right. Um, and uh, the truth of the is issue for me is, you know, the year that I was born, it was illegal to be gay in the UK. You could be sent to jail or worse, chemically castrated. The year that I was born, it was illegal to have an interracial relationship in many of the southern states of the United States. And now, 52, weeks, 52 years later, you know, I'm a black guy that's married to a white German guy, and we've been able to create biologically created children uh, as the generosity of an egg donor. And uh, my son is my husband's DNA, uh, my daughter is my DNA, and we are one family unit. And none of that would have been possible the year that I was born. And I pinch myself every day that I am now living this lifestyle, this dream, this family reality that is a complete and utter miracle. Uh, and however, however much challenge there is in the public discourse right now all around the world about whether or not humanity is genuinely moving forward, I am really, really confident that in my daughter, particularly in my daughter's life, in 50 years' time, she's going to look back at the last 50 years and she's going to go, you know, there was a time that the majority of companies were run by men, but now it's equal, run by women, run by men. And I want my family to be a symbol of how far somebody can move, how far society can move in somebody's lifetime. Because, you know, I hope that I'm around on my daughter's 50th birthday and I hope that she is going, it's true, women did get to run the world. And so while you were at Airbnb, there were some issues with being inclusive and things that you had to face head on. How difficult was that, especially when you're encouraging that, you stand for that? Yeah, yeah. In uh, 2017, the Harvard Business School released a report that actually had significant data to evidence that um, African Americans found it more challenging to book a home on Airbnb than Caucasian Americans. Um, and that started a huge media narrative and social media narrative um, uh, where things like Airbnb whilst black was starting to um, trend. And actually other competitors to Airbnb started to spring up welcoming minorities to travel on their home sharing sites. And so we knew that we had to uh, take this issue very seriously. It's the biggest challenge to ever happen to uh, Airbnb in its now 12 year history. Uh, and um, we got the entire community to sign a declaration of zero tolerance for discrimination, bigotry, any form of racism on the platform. And if a host and traveler didn't sign, then they'd be taken off the platform. Uh, we introduced very sophisticated intelligence so that we could monitor the public health of the conversation on Airbnb. And Brian Chesky was magnificent in his declaration. He was, uh, I'm prepared to slow down the growth of Airbnb so that when we reignite the growth of Airbnb, we know we're doing it in a wholesome and inclusive way. And it took us just eight months to go from the biggest PR crisis in Airbnb's history to being confident enough that we'd done enough work on the platform itself so we could go out with a Super Bowl spot that celebrated anybody of any difference and promise them that they would always find acceptance and a home on the platform. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan. We are so glad to have you here. And we're so glad that you helped create a platform, a world where anyone can belong anywhere.